On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including NASA returns to the moon, SpaceX continues to prep their lunar lander systems, the UK government invests in orbital sustainability, and Relativity Space preps to launch their 3D printed rocket. There's lots to go over this week, so let's get going. This is the Space Race. The launch of NASA's Capstone satellite on a Rocket Lab Electron spacecraft this week marks the first step in NASA's three-part process to return to the moon in 2022. Over the course of the next year, NASA will establish their presence in lunar orbit with research and reconnaissance missions that will lay the groundwork for human beings to once again set foot on the moon. The first small but very important step is called Capstone. This CubeSat was launched earlier this week and leads a trifecta of missions planned for this year and early 2023 that includes the Lunar Trailblazer and the first launch attempt of the SLS and Orion spacecraft in late summer of this year. And taking a closer look at these three missions in particular, it's easy to see why NASA and their partners are making these setup launches a priority. Capstone, also known as Cislunar Autonomous Positioning System Technology Operations and Navigation Experiment, is a mission plan to last only six months. It will reportedly aid the Artemis program by assisting in navigation and mapping out a solid orbit around the moon so future crafts like the upcoming Gateway Station can achieve safe orbits more easily. The little 55-pound CubeSat was launched on a Rocket Lab Electron rocket and is equipped with solar arrays, a camera, and various antennas for navigation and communication. It was built for NASA by Advanced Space for $13.7 million and is the first commercial company to operate in an Earth-Moon three-body orbit. NASA's SLS rocket has had no small amount of issues during testing, including this most recent wet dress rehearsal on June 20th, which discovered a leak from the core stage's bleed quick disconnect. Despite this discovery, however, NASA officials believe the SLS is fit for launch and are pushing for a launch as early as August of this year. Despite the leak, this was the first time SLS was able to be fully fueled. And if the leak can be fixed, Artemis 1 will send an uncrewed Orion capsule to the moon and back within the year. If this test flight is successful, then NASA will repeat the mission to lunar orbit with a crewed capsule in 2024 on Artemis 2, and then finally send human beings back to the moon's surface in 2025 on Artemis 3. Trailblazer is another CubeSat, but this one is meant to scout ahead for the Artemis landers. It's equipped with a spectrometer and a thermal mapper to try to survey the moon for distribution of water ice, a key indicator of where to land our astronauts and establish future operations on the moon. While the satellite will be ready for launch by 2023, the rideshare it was scheduled for, the IMAP missions, had to be delayed until 2025 to allow for the principal equipment to be finished. But NASA has a tight schedule, so they found Trailblazer another ride. Trailblazer will reportedly now be a secondary payload on Intuitive Machine's IM-2 mission, which will be delivering the second automated lander to the moon's South Pole regions for drilling and study. This will launch in early 2023 on a SpaceX rocket. The pace of these launches, the hurdles NASA is jumping, and the schedule they're flipping all paint a picture of a space agency determined to see this important mission done with a minimum of delays. There is so much to do before we even see astronauts back on the moon's surface, and clearly NASA is in no mood to delay the missions that would give us the vital data we need to safely get them there. We know from NASA communications that the team has been working very hard to set all these dominoes up. Public and commercial efforts across the industry are working together to make Artemis a reality, and it really feels like everyone is taking their first steadying breaths before the sprint begins. On your marks. 
And speaking of the race to the moon, SpaceX is off and running after the FAA cleared the rocket company for testing of their super heavy booster and Starship vehicles at Starbase in Texas. This massive rocket will play a leading role in NASA's Artemis 3 mission as the Starship lunar lander returns human beings to the moon's surface. There's been lots of activity in the lead up to these tests. Infrastructure work is being done with the Mechazilla Tower being pieced together on the Florida coast, for example. But all eyes are on the activity surrounding Booster 7 at Starbase. On Thursday, the 23rd of June, Super Heavy Booster 7, with all 33 Raptor 2 engines installed, was rolled out of the bay and to the launch site. It was quite the sight to see this huge 70 meter tall booster making the hour long trek to Starbase's launch armature, but the best was yet to come. After a couple of hours of calibration, the robotic chopstick arms of Starbase's Mechazilla Tower lifted and rotated Booster 7 onto the orbital launch mount. This is the first time that SpaceX has lifted a super heavy with the tower arms and not a giant crane. It is extremely exciting to see the chopstick arms working as intended, but even more exciting to think of the possibility of them catching the booster during landing tests that could be happening later this summer. That lift test makes the activity in Florida much more exciting as the tower at Cape Canaveral has begun the process of being put together. On Tuesday the 21st, a massive crane began lifting the pre-built sections into position. Those of you who follow the channel might remember that the orbital launch and integration tower at Cape Canaveral is being built differently. Thanks to the lessons learned with the Starbase Tower, the Florida Mechazilla is being fully built in pieces and then transported to the final destination. This makes the tricky electrical and plumbing work easier and safer to do while allowing for quicker construction on site. Once the pieces are in place, all the engineers have to do is cinch up the connections and the tower will be good to go for future work. With a second launch tower in the heart of America's space program, the Starship will be ready to become a true workhorse of the aerospace industry. And this is also likely to be the site where the lunar Starship HLS lander will launch to the moon. And it's that future work that we're all excited for. Aside from wet dress rehearsals, the next big test will be the static fire of the Raptor 2 engines on Booster 7. We know from the FAA ruling that SpaceX is allowed 135 seconds of super heavy static fire tests. Given that these engines haven't been fired on this scale before, it's likely that the team will opt to fire single engines, then maybe a full ring, and then if all things are still nominal, we might see the full 33 engine burn. All of this exciting stuff is on top of the other infrastructure work happening on site at Starbase. The crane building the mega bay was pulled down, indicating that the building is almost complete on at least the tall parts of that building. And next to that, the structure of the massive star factory is coming together quickly with roof work reportedly taking place. It looks like SpaceX's work with the FAA all year is finally paying off. All of their projects are either coming together quickly or being completed just as the PEA gave the go-ahead for testing. I'd imagine the crew at Starbase has a pretty stacked schedule for the rest of the summer, so make sure to cheer on their hard work in the comments. It looks like the British government sees an opportunity to step into a leadership role regarding sustainability in orbit. The UK announced on June 23rd that they would be enacting a series of measures that include regulatory and financial action to address the growing debris problem in low Earth orbit. The goal, as stated by George Freeman, Minister for Science, Research and Innovation, is to set a global commercial framework for the insurability, the licensing, the regulation of commercial satellites, so that we drive down the cost for those who comply with the best standards of sustainability. We have to mainstream sustainability in our commercial sector. And he's not wrong. Just this month, the ISS had to make an emergency maneuver to avoid debris from a destroyed satellite. Companies like NanoRacks and Astroscale are testing commercial solutions to this problem, 
If they could get some backing, who knows what innovative new solutions would be developed. So the UK's plan is fourfold. First, they intend to set up a regulatory framework for all orbital activities. You can't really address a problem without a plan. So that certainly makes sense as a first step. We want it to be industry-led and government-backed, Freeman says. The second part follows directly from the first. The UK plans to work internationally with organizations like the United Nations and the G7 nations for more widespread adoption of the sustainability framework. The third part is to develop a set of simple, accurate metrics for measuring sustainability of any space operations. This one is also a no-brainer. Regulations don't mean much if there's no way to measure a company's adherence to the new rules, or if those methods are overly complicated. As an added bonus, Freeman mentions it would help insurance on orbital licensing go down if a company is compliant with the new rules. The fourth part is where they get to finally do some direct action. This is the funding part. Currently, the plan is to provide roughly $6.1 million for the development of an active debris removal program. This will reportedly start with a bid for two companies to be selected later this summer. For reference, this part of the program is the next step in a plan started by contracts awarded last year to a group led by Astroscale, who just recently helped test the feasibility of cleanup efforts with their ELSA-D satellite. The goal of a clean and sustainable orbit is definitely something we should get on sooner rather than later, but this isn't just about cleaning up space trash. Freeman notes that the real goal is to build on the US-led Artemis Accords to establish both peaceful but crucially sustainable space exploration. This Astro Carta would ensure all parties operating in our increasingly crowded orbit some measure of safety, promoting peaceful collaboration. High ideals paired with a solid plan for action. You love to see it. Rocket startup Relativity Space has shipped their first 3D printed rocket, the Terran 1, to their recently constructed launch pad at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. The 9.3-ton Terran-1 is a mostly 3D-printed rocket with 9 printed aluminum boosters. It is 85% printed by mass and has the bragging rights of being the largest single 3D-printed object ever built. The rocket is designed to handle payloads of about 1.2 to 1.3 tons, launching them into low Earth orbit. Relativity is obviously gunning for a spot in the small sat industry, and they're not the only ones. By sheer coincidence, two other rocket startups are attempting to certify and launch their new rockets at almost the same time. ABL Space in Alaska and Firefly Space in California both have similarly capable rockets ready for testing this summer. Firefly's Alpha rocket is almost entirely made of lightweight carbon fiber composites, which explains why it's slightly more expensive than the other two, but it has already successfully static fired their first and second stages, so they're in the lead for launch capability with a projected launch sometime in July. ABL's RS-1 is in the same boat as the Terran-1. The RS-1, however, is made more traditionally with welded aluminum, and they suffered a major failure during their first attempt at qualifying their upper stage. Terran 1, by comparison, hasn't had any failures so far, and its 3D printed construction is part of a growing trend in rocket sustainability. And while all three companies are aiming for quick launch cadences on a budget, Relativity is hoping their Terran 1 will be the first step in 3D printing rockets on Mars and beyond. The next step for the Terran 1 is booster qualification testing, and if that goes off without a hitch, they should be ready for launch around August along with ABL's RS-1. More rockets and more different rockets is something we'll always be excited for here, but this competition is something fun to see. Who do you think will fare the best? Maybe all of them will do well. Let us know in the comments below. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. 
Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.